Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, Beth and Luther College and the Yogosacra Fine Arts Center. This is part of our guest artist series at Bethany, where we continue to discover what God has given us and we explore the possibilities. Um, <clears throat> we, have, uh, we have a fascinating artist with us uh, who drove up today from uh, central Iowa, Eric Gapster. Eric Gapster um, is a professional comic book artist. He has uh, two graphic novels under his belt and one underway. Yep. One, two, and three from the Sort of Super series. We see uh, original artwork on the walls from Sort of Super 1 and Sort of Super 2, the Magma Cup. And uh, you'll also see on the walls uh, original artwork from Marvel and DC titles. Eric has done work uh, for both of those uh, major uh, comic book forces. Um, he's kind of living my dream. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I attended uh, the Young Michelangelo Art Camp here, uh, comics were a big part of uh, the appeal to a young artist. And uh, we, were, we were doing it. We were drawing and, and dreaming about what if you could do this? What if, you, what if it could be real? Somebody has to draw these things. Well, that somebody's here tonight. Please welcome Eric Gapster. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I don't get out much. Uh, drawing comics takes uh, an incredible amount of time, and I'm a father of two, so um, I kind of live at work. Um, there's really not much of a day where I'm not either um, drawing something, writing something, or um, you know, just uh, being with my family. So um, this is a special treat for me. Um, uh, so I appreciate you having me, and I, I love to talk comics. Um, Drawing is a really solitary job. Um, I have friends that, uh, you know, we can get on the phone, um, but, you know, when you do that, uh, suddenly the day has passed and you haven't gotten anything done. So we try to be really judicious about that. So it's a, it's a treat to come um, and be able to talk about things. So um, I'll tell you a little bit, excuse me, about myself um, and kind of how I became a cartoonist, um, how I got to work for Marvel and DC and uh, make some graphic novels. Um, but really we can keep this as casual as we want. Um, I really encourage questions. Like I said, I, I kind of talk a little bit about myself to get, you know, a lot of the general questions out of the way that everyone asks, but, um, it's always really more beneficial, um, you know, for you all, um, to ask what you want to know rather than just kind of listen to me blather, um, about what I think you want to know. Um, and, and it's wide open too. I love talking about, you know, all the technical aspects of, uh, you know, dynamic storytelling or, you know, what kind of pencils I use. They're really specific, what kind of paper. Um, but also, you know, we can get into who would win in a fight, Superman or the Hulk. Like it's all on, <laughs> it's all on a table. So, um, and I, like I said, I can talk about this stuff forever. You might get 15 minutes of me talking after one question, but I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I mean, it's past seven o'clock. We just had a big meal, and it's, I mean, it's close to bedtime, so I won't, I won't keep you here long. Um, but I grew up in a small town in Iowa, um, Belle Plaine. is about 2,500 people, and um, really, really tough to find comic books in a small town um, in, in 1993, Iowa in 1993. Uh, so the only place that they had them was a grocery store, and that was the sole distributor of uh, comics in my youth. And I, but... My first one was Amazing Spider-Man number 350, and I was hooked from the moment I read it. Um, there was just something about um, the intimacy and the interactivity of comics. Um, you know, what happens between the panels you are a participant in. You know, you see one thing happening, then you see another, and you're that connective tissue. And um, I think that really, really spoke to me. I couldn't articulate that as a kid, but um, I've come to understand that, that that's a big part of it. And also, I love drawing. I love writing. Um, I don't like to just draw pictures. Um, I love to tell a story with them, and I don't like to just write without, um, I don't like to write without pictures. So this, this is really, you know, took um, two really natural forms of self-expression for me as a kid. And, um, you know, my cousin uh, Derek was just joking about how even as a kid, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really play with the other cousins. I was always just off by myself drawing. And I didn't think I realized that. Um, I was just doing what, you know, what excited me and what came naturally, um, much to the, you know, frustration of my cousins who, you know, would like me to 
participate, you know, in, in being a family. Um, but uh, yeah, so from a really young age, um, the third grade, I, I knew I wanted to be a comic book artist. I didn't know how to do that. Um, my friends and I, we would just draw. We would just constantly draw. Um, but it was tough, like I said, finding comics. Uh, you know, the grocery store had, you know, like, you would get an issue of Spider-Man. I might get number 350, but uh, you wouldn't get number 351. They wouldn't get 352. And like, you know, six months later, like now you have 357. And, and it happened across all the titles, not just Spider-Man, but like I got one issue of Impulse and that's the only one I ever saw. I got a letter, I wrote to DC Comics and um, I, I wrote them a letter about how awesome I, I thought Impulse was. And since I never got another issue, I didn't find out until about three years ago that they published my letter in number 16. I wrote in about number 10, and then come to find out, you know, some 30 years later, they published my letter, and that's the real feather. I'm like, I would have been so proud of that as a kid. I didn't, I didn't know, because the comics didn't come to me. Um, the closest comic book store was in a place called Cedar Rapids, where I live now. Um, it was about 35 minutes away, and I could not convince my parents to, you know, drive me there at the drop of a hat for you know, the next issue of, of Batman. They, I had to wait until my dad needed something at Menards or you know, at a, some other you know, thing we couldn't get in town. And it was just, I could never go there enough. And, um, and I'm telling you all of this um, because this is kind of how my comics career started. I was so enthralled by these, but I was also really impatient and those um, comic books that, you know, like I mentioned, I would read number 350 and I wouldn't get 351, 350. Eventually, I got so sick of that, not knowing those stories and not knowing that, you know, back issue bins existed in comic book stores, not being able to get there. And, uh, you know, it would, the world today would blow my 12 year old. I mean, it still impresses me that you can get any comic book you want on your phone. You, know, you pay Marvel like 60 bucks a year and you can just read anything. Um, that that would have that would have exploded my young mind. Um, I'm still really impressed by it. I'm not jaded enough by technology to still not be impressed by, you know, the entirety of the history of Marvel and DC just in my pocket right now. Um, but I didn't have any of that. So what I would do is I would write and draw the ending myself. I would just pick up where those stories left off and on any kind of paper I could find with any pencils, with any colored pencils, crayons, whatever I could find. I would finish those stories, I would staple them together, and I would show anybody um, you know, that I could. Um, and I got such a positive reaction. You know, I'm still, we joke that you know, artists, like you get that one really positive hit of dopamine where your parents are like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I'm still chasing that you know, with every drawing. Um, but, uh, but, it, but it was encouraging and it was cool to you know, like have you know, some reciprocity for the excitement that I felt, and the, you know, to, to be able to give people that excitement. Um, it's, it was like a drug. Um, I, I laugh because there's this meme about, there's like six pictures of, you know, what people look like um, when they have been using certain drugs. And, you know, it has really hard ones like, uh, like cocaine or something. The last panel is comics. And it's just, it's just a dude smiling. <laughs> And it's, it's so true, like I'm still, I'm, you know, I'm as excited as I am, um, I'm more excited now, um, partly because I can draw a lot better, um, and I know how to do this a lot better than I, than I did as a kid, but I still, I, I still have that same zeal, and I still have that same love, um, because that really, um, you know, when you have uh, a dream, and I, I had a dream as a kid to, to, to do, draw comics, and, I mean, really the, the only secret, and when people ask me, how do you become a comic book artist? And it's just to never stop. No matter, don't let anybody tell you to stop. Don't tell yourself to stop, um, because the industry will give you every reason to, um, and the business side of it is not great. Um, or it can be not great. You know, it's, there's, there's kind of a, everything is a mixed bag, uh, kind of a theme in a lot of my comics too. Um, but um, really that's, I just never gave up, and I still have just not given up. Um, because that's the only way you'll get an answer, is if, if you close that door. Um, and, I, and, I, and I really believe that, and I try to impart that to um, a lot of kids. I, I talk to a lot of uh, elementary schools with uh, my graphic novels are from uh, middle grade, um, and that's it's a little confusing. It's not middle school, it's for elementary school. but. Um, that's just one thing I really want to impart is that it's, it's, it's all on you um, to just not listen to anyone and just go and see how far that takes you. There's no guarantee it'll take you 
anywhere but you know the next step and i and everybody's on a different you know level the you know i'm i'm still thinking about the next issue who's who's going to draw the next ghost rider annual um whereas like you know you'll probably know who jim lee is uh president of dc comics you know he's he's not thinking about that anymore but but he's probably not settled just being the president uh, you know he's still probably got ambition so with every step that you take you just keep going and you're going and um and just the love of doing this is really what has sustained me um, because at the end of the day, there are a lot of things. I would love to be able to call my own shots, but I can't. Um, I would love to be able to just write and draw whatever I want, but I can't. Um, I've been really fortunate with the opportunities I have uh, I've had, um, but um, really it's, um, you know, the love of telling stories with pictures and words is what has sustained me. So. Um, I got a little off track. I usually have a little story about how I came to do it before I got into all that inspirational stuff, or hopefully it was inspirational. It sounded like it to me as I was saying it. Um, but uh, so how I actually did it, I mean, really it comes back to just not stopping at every stage. So, um, you know, what started as just making my own comics uh, to finish all these stories that I could never buy, um, you know, you, you draw a lot more, you get a lot better. You, kind of learn some more about the world. And um, the other place you could really find comics um, back again in the 90s in a small town in Iowa um, were newspapers, uh, the funnies. Um, still very prevalent, not so much anymore, but uh, Calvin and Hobbes is hugely, hugely influential. And as a kid, it was, um, so I started out drawing Spider-Man and Batman, but like eventually you kind of get, there's a little disconnect with how excited your parents are and how your drawing actually looks next to, you know, the, the actual published stuff. You're like, hmm, I'm not really, I'm not really replicating this. I'm not really, <laughs> I don't really think I'm that good. And uh, so when I found Calvin and Hobbes and Peanuts and Mutts, um, that really cartoony aesthetic really spoke to me. Um, and it's, kind of, it's been funny seeing my career play out because I really latched onto those. I wanted to be a newspaper comic strip artist. I didn't, I didn't aspire to draw Spider-Man um, anymore. I wanted to write and draw my own stories and my own characters. And um, all those, you know, because when you look at a, at a drawing of Spider-Man, it's pretty hyper-realistic. There's all those muscles that you have to know where they all go. Like, what are those rib muscles even called? You know, like, I can't pronounce serratus. Um, <laughs> But when you look at a drawing like Calvin and Hobbes, you know, it's deceptively simple and you, your brain tricks you, that's easy, that looks easy, you can do that, without understanding that cartooning is all about simplification. So even though there are fewer lines, the lines become more important um, uh, as, you, as you, you know, reduce your drawing. Um, and, and, and also you have to learn all the rules before you can break them. So you actually do have to know what serratus is and where it goes. Um, but, um, that didn't deter me. I didn't know any of that then. Um, I just wanted to write and draw my own stories. So that's what I did. And um, so I wrote and drew stories in uh, the newspaper. Uh, luckily, there weren't really any other cartoonists where I was growing up. So I had kind of free reign to, uh, and no competition to um, draw a comic strip in my high school newspaper. And there weren't really a lot of uh, degrees in comic book art. Um, there, there were some, but they were all at, uh, we called them ACAD colleges, uh, like the Minneapolis College of Art and Design had a program, a Savannah College of Art and Design, Joe Kubert, World of Cartooning in New Jersey. They were all super duper expensive. Um, and I got some advice that was basically, how many of your cartooning heroes went through a program at a, at a college to do this? And my answer was none. And uh, the cartoonist I was talking to was like, exactly, you don't, all it takes is for you to keep doing this. Um, but you know, if you can go to school, and, and I was, um, um, it was never really a question about um, if, but where. Um, so I picked a university um, that had a comic book store right across the street from the dormitory. <laughs> Iowa State University, Mayhem Comics. I was just there earlier today, still there, still great. Um, I kid. Uh, the, <laughs> It, it was very fortuitous to, to be able to roll out of bed and uh, walk across the street and be at a, at a comic book store. I'm not gonna lie, that was, that was still a huge part of why that experience in college was so great. But um, fortunately for me, 
Um, Iowa State University had, the, had one of the best college newspapers in all of the United States, uh, the Iowa State Daily. And um, it took me a couple of years to, to figure out how to get on there. But um, once I did, um, you know, they, they found a job for me illustrating opinion articles. So I would read someone's article and I would kind of come up with a visual illustration for it. And I, if like a month later, the political cartoonist quit. And I didn't know anything about politics. I couldn't have told you the difference um, between a, a Republican or a Democrat in you know early 2000s um, America, but I could tell a story. And I thought I was a quick learner. I wasn't, I, I really didn't. Um, but I, I was an effective communicator, even if the ideas weren't always really that great. And um, so I ended up doing that. But uh, once I had proven to my, um, you know, my fellow coworkers at the, at the paper that you know, they knew I was a good cartoonist, they just let me write and draw my own comic strip, which is what I really wanted to do. And so I was drawing three things a day, five days a week, and failing a lot of classes. Um, but I was loving every minute of it because I was paying my rent by drawing, they, they would pay me, I mean, it seems quaint now, but like $25 for an illustration, that was a lot of money in 2003. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, almost $100 a day, you know, and rent wasn't crazy and, you know, things like financial aid, but uh, I was doing it. I was like, I'm never going back. I'm never not, you know, drawing for a living. And oh, you sweet summer child. <laughs> Um, I, I did not, uh, so after graduation, you know, I still didn't really know how to get a job drawing newspaper cartoons. I knew that those, these, you know, amorphous things called syndicates existed and you would pitch your ideas to them. And I had such a high opinion of my drawing skills, um, that I did not see how poor my writing was. And, uh, and it was a struggle of succeeding a lot, um, kind of through college and after it, um, it was a real big reality check um, because uh, nobody was, like, they would send rejections. They were all form rejections. Um, and it was tough to, tough to kind of swallow that. So um, spoiler alert, I did not uh, get a job drawing after college. I worked at a Barnes and Noble and um, would continue to draw at night um, just because I was so determined. Um, and I was really doing all this myself. I was writing, drawing, penciling, inking, uh, coloring, every aspect of it. And I was doing it in such a big volume that I got better and better. And around this time I met um, a man named Phil Hester who penciled for uh, DC Comics and Marvel Comics, had a really long career. And he's like the only guy in Iowa at the time um, who had really done that. And he was really riding a high of popularity off of, uh, he did a Green Arrow run with Kevin Smith, the filmmaker. And so um, I ended up meeting him. He invited me to his studio. I showed him my comic strips. He's like, yeah, I've never really done anything with comic strips. I've done every other kind of cartooning, but he's like, I got nothing to really help you with. It. But he was looking at him and he's like, your lines are really great. Your inking is really competent. Um, have you ever wanted to collaborate? And I was like, no one's ever asked. <laughs> um, so he's like, well, hey, uh, my inker lives in Kansas City, and we got this process now where I draw the, I, he draws on, um, his pencils on a board, scans them in, and his buddy Andy Parks prints them out and inks a blue line. So they have these, so he, has, he had like six issues of, uh, the miniseries was El Diablo. Um, he had six issues of El Diablo pencils, and he's like, Nobody bought this book. It, I think at the time it was like DC's lowest selling book ever. And he was like, if you wanna practice on these pencils, inking over my stuff, like you're welcome to. And what a rare opportunity. Come to find out that uh, ink, like doing inking samples not on top of professional pencils really meant finding Xerox copies and then vellum overlays. And I cannot think of a more tedious or painstaking, like miserable, way to ink a comic book than to do that. But that's how it was done because the technology just hadn't been there, um, hadn't gotten there to be able to, um, you know, print blue lines unless you have a specific kind of printer. The technology's caught up and, you know, it's pretty easy to get now. But at the time, inking professional pencils really unheard of. And so I got this really rare opportunity and I did not succeed at it right away. Um, it was a whole new thing for me and I was so tentative and scared because um, I didn't want to mess them up. Um, but 
uh, you got over, I got over it really quick and uh, started learning what it meant to maybe um, work for Marvel or DC and uh, still writing and drawing my own stuff on the side um, and pitching and getting rejected. So it was just, it was just a lot of work and just not seeing those gains. But what excited me still was um, new opportunities in uh, storytelling. You know, I'd never wanted to, I'd never thought I was good enough to do um, work for Marvel and DC because it was so complicated, or it looked so complicated, those drawings were so involved. Um, and a lot of that mystery was peeled away um, by inking Phil's work and really understanding how storytelling works. My comic strips, my writing, everything got better by doing this. And um, so my job at the time was, uh, I was working at a company called Integrated DNA Technologies, uh, completely outside of my wheelhouse. They synthesized some, uh, DNA for research purposes. And I was just a fact checker. I didn't have to understand any science. Uh, but I, um, Phil calls me up one day. He's like, hey, uh, this publisher forgot to ask me to do a cover. And uh, Andy can't ink it. So I need this turned around overnight. And I was like, yeah? Okay, so I was working from like 10 o'clock to I think I got out of work by like 7 or 8. And uh, I stayed up all night doing it. And I could do that back then. I, I would die now. Uh, about <laughs> 3 in the morning, I would just keel over and my body would take over. But at the time, I, I, I can distinctly remember this is before COVID, um, year, many years before COVID. But um, uh, the grocery stores were open 24 hours. I don't know if they're back to doing that anymore um, where I live. Because I don't, I, I don't see twelve o'clock, or I don't see, <laughs> I don't see midnight anymore. Uh, but at the time, I just remember going at midnight, like going and getting some food, and thinking, I got so much time. It's only midnight. I'm half done. This is great. And like, I didn't sleep. I just worked straight through, um, and got it done. And um, and so that was my first professional work. Uh, I was inking a Green Hornet cover for Dynamite, and uh, real fun you know, like uh, splash into the business side of things. Uh, you voucher for things as a freelancer. You're not an employee. Um, so you just send in a piece of paper with your page rate. And I'm like, well, what do I put for my rate? So I was like, well, just put what I, what I would get. It's like 150 bucks a page. I'm like, great, $150. And uh, immediately accounting gets back to me. I'm like, who approved this? And I'm like, oh God, I, I don't know. <laughs> I just, and so apparently $150 is a lot of money for an inking page. And somebody who's just starting out isn't gonna make that much. And uh, it ended up being fine. They met me halfway, um, but they're like, from here on out, it's $88. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you're, not, you're the boss. <laughs> um, but pretty quickly, um, fortuitously for me, Andy started kind of stop taking inking work to focus more on writing. So I took over a lot of his stuff and uh, ended up getting like an issue of Batman to do. Um, and how cool is that for the, your first comic, like full, first full issue to be Batman? Like it's all downhill from there, right? Um, but it was, it was such a high um, kind of slowly getting bigger and bigger projects um, until they offered us a year on the flash and my first son had just been born. And his, just, his schedule was such that I was never seeing him because of my work schedule. That was really hard on me. And so once they offered that, I thought, I'm gonna take the jump. I'm going to talk to my wife, I'm gonna quit my job, and I'm going to do comics full time because I have this year where I know I have a certain amount of work and I can dive head first and hustle more. And um, I had about a month, if I remember right, before um, we had really inexpensive daycare and she retired. And so I had like this really blissful month where I was, all I was doing was drawing during the day. I had like, I was home alone, no one, you know, there were no distractions. And then she retired and we were immediately back into this, like, I was like, well, we don't need another, we don't need to worry about daycare. I will just stay home and I'll go back to working on comics at night. Um, and that's what I've done ever since. My, my kids, just this last year, um, they're both in school. Um, so I, I do have full days to work now. But um, at the time, I was right back to where I started. But again, just that, just still excited about those opportunities. Um, and they just kind of keep getting, they kept getting bigger. And, um, you know, longer projects. And, um, and it didn't last. Um, but enough small things came along and um, I was still pitching comic strips 
And I got really close to getting what I thought was a contract from a syndicate. I was actually had a relationship with them. I was putting my material on their website, uh, gocomics.com. It was the same one with Calvin and Hobbes. And um, just long story short, come to find out, like I was not close as I thought I was. Um, and it ended up being like, like I kind of did the math. I was like, it's going to be like best case scenario, six years before I make any money on this, like any serious money. If everything goes right, I was like, I got to set this aside. And I was doing a comic strip based on the characters um, in sort of super. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't a, a narrative. Um, it was just, you know, kind of this slice of life story of this uh, little kid who uh, is a little bumbling, um, really earnest, but incapable, um, who got superpowers and, uh, and it just wasn't going anywhere. And like, I, I was getting royalty checks digitally. Like uh, it was, it was, you know, it wasn't in print. It was on their website, but you still got royalties based on how many people looked at the website. And after like four months of work, my my artwork is really involved. Um, we're not talking, um, and not to pick on anybody, but a lot of those comic strips are really, really simplistic um, and don't take a ton of time. Um, it, like God bless Ryan North. You know, it's the same. You know, uh, this dinosaur strip is the same picture, just with brilliantly with different words. Um, and I was just beating my brains out, you know, like trying to have dynamic storytelling in four tiny panels. <laughs> and I just looked at this $186 check and I was just like, I can't do, I can't justify this to myself. I can't justify this to my wife. I can't justify this to my son. I gotta quit. And that was the first time I walked away from anything um, comics related. I just, I'd never quit. But in my mind, I completely like, that was, I was done. I wasn't gonna do comic strips anymore. And so I started to, um, okay, inking isn't, you know, in the industry, inking is still a job you can have. I still do it to this day um, over other people, but it's not what it once was where you could kind of get two or three assignments to really sustain yourself. Um, I was always really cruising on one, and it was kind of like a part-time job. So, you know, it's kind of one of those gut check moments where you're like, what else am I going to do? Um, so I started penciling, um, and I knew that that really cartoony aesthetic that I was using for comic strips wasn't really going to fly. It wasn't what you saw in Marvel and DC comic books, uh, for the most part. Um, obviously, Scotty Young had that market cornered um, for all of Marvel and DC, and so I thought, I got to pull this back, and I got to see, you know, I just got to see where this takes me, and see, like, I had been doing this for so many years and had kind of this vision, and suddenly I felt really lost. Um, because I didn't know what I wanted a comic book to look like. Um, so those are some really, um, it took me about a year um, to really figure out a new style and start to get some work out of it. And But I did, I, I did a, a series called, uh, I, so when we were working on The Flash, luckily Phil was behind. Um, the artist they were gonna get to replace him on an issue uh, flaked, excuse me. And uh, my editor was just like, he knew I was kind of wanting to do some of that. So he's like, hey, send in some samples. And I did, and he's like, yeah, we'll give you, we'll give you half an issue. And so like my first penciling assignment was The Flash. I was in so over my head. Um, Cause I also had to like, cause Phil was catching up on the next issue. So I was getting pages of his to ink while I had to pencil and ink my own. And I was still really finding myself. I was one of the most stressful two weeks of my life. And, and my grandmother passed away during this. And I was just like, I cannot believe like, just the timing of everything was, you know, I don't know where I'm going with this. It was really stressful. <laughs> um, but I look back and laugh now because, um, you know, it's even going through all that stress, it was still enjoyable. And kind of the same way inking rolled on, um, I started getting more uh, penciling work. Uh, I got 10 issues of a series called Animosity Evolution. Um, and that was... Um, a springboard to getting work on James Bond 007. And um, while I was working on James Bond, I started getting calls to do um, some more DC penciling. And I was a lot better at this point. So um, if you see the, the Shazam and Commandy pages that are in the hanging up back there, um, those are just short eight page stories. But while I was doing those, I found out about uh, the children's book market. Um, and when I talk about comic book market, we kind of refer to that as the direct market when you think of comic book shops and um, you know periodicals, floppies like uh, Marvel and DC Comics. Well, the book market is what you kind of, Scholastic, Simon & Schuster, the big five publishing houses, and they're totally separate worlds. And I didn't even really know that one existed. I didn't know Dogman was outselling everything by a factor of 100. Um, 
but what I did find out is a buddy of mine who would also want to do comic strips um, and wasn't gaining much traction doing that, he ended up getting a book deal. And I was like, hey, what is this? Like, explain this to me. I had no idea what an agent was. I didn't know how to get an agent. Um, I didn't know you couldn't. Like at Marvel and DC, you have personal relationships with editors and you create those yourselves. Um, you can't get those at uh, like Scholastic. You have to have an agent and it, you know, it's kind of that, um, you have to sell yourself to an agent first. I knew none of that. But the stories they were telling in these graphic novels for uh, middle grade was really the wheelhouse of what I wanted to do um, with my comic strip just told in a narrative form. And it was the best creative decision, uh, or it was the best creative revelation, I guess, um, because I didn't know I wanted to make graphic novels until I was doing it. I was not great at writing comic strips. And it, I mean, really, it was like beating my head against the wall to write those sometimes. And, and again, like the, the work just, some of it still holds up, but um, for the most part, not great. But once I started taking the characters that I had and writing in sort of super and building a world for them and building a story for them, um, it, the feeling was like melting butter. I don't know how to describe it. It was just, you know, really going from punching a wall to, um, you know, now the wall is massaging my hand. And um, I don't know where I was going at, but uh, <laughs> that doesn't really sound very good either. It's, um, the wall was being nice to me, I don't know. <laughs> um, now I've completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I find out about this and, um, you know, it took me about a year to kind of understand like, okay, here's how you get an agent. You write a query letter, you come up with a pitch and, you know, it's kind of its own art, um, uh, kind of distilling your entire 200 and 36 page graphic novel into one sentence, um, but you gotta do it to, you know, it's an elevator pitch, you have to sell them on it. And uh, so once I um, had kind of figured that out, um, I'd sent probably in about, uh, let's see, uh, February or March of 2019, I sent out about five um, queries and all rejections, or I didn't hear from them. And kind of realized I wasn't doing a very good job of writing a query letter and it took about till September um, till I was really confident in mine, waiting for a colorist to kind of color some sample pages that I decided to just go ahead and send it out, not wait for the colorist, I didn't think it mattered. And I was right. And um, you know, after trying and selling a comic strip for I think I 17 years of working on it, was like, I think I stopped in 2017 and I really created the character of Wyatt in 20, 2001. Um, so in fun, one form or another, you know, trying and failing for 17 years um, to um, an agent responded, my agents that I have now responded to my query in 15 minutes. Um, they wanted to get on the phone with me and they were so excited about the project. And, and, I, don't, and I know this, project, this process is really, really difficult and it's really not typical to have that quick of a reaction, but I, I, I talk about it not to brag, but to just, you know, it's part of this larger picture that, um, you know, it took years and years of rejection and another thing and then turning it into something else and finally getting that excitement. I can't describe the feeling of people just getting what I was trying to do and not only getting it, but being excited and wanting to represent me. I'm like, hey, let's get this in front of editors. This is a sure thing. And, um, you know, 15 minutes, uh, we were on the phone later that day. Contracts were signed by Wednesday. Two weeks later, we had a pitch out to editors. Uh, we're not, sorry. By Wednesday, we had a pitch out, out to editors after the contracts were signed. And in two weeks, we had an offer. And so it was really, you know, this, this completely foreign um, experience to me, like just having people be excited about my work and not having to, you know, like justify it or wonder if it's gonna go anywhere. So, um, so that was really exciting for a couple months and then COVID hit and um, the world was upended. And I thought I was in a really good position because I thought, well, I'd work and live at home anyway, um, but I was, you know, it's a different world when, um, you know, and I was used to having my kids at home, but um, they were not used to, you know, school at home. And there was a lot of adjustment and just, um, you know, you couldn't really leave the house for a while. And uh, so it was still a really cool, um, it, it was really this oasis for me, uh, the work in that time. Um, because, you know, everybody struggled and to various degrees, and especially every kid 
um, did. So those are really rough years. And I won't get into all of that, um, but suffice to say, you know, again, just that love of, you know, making comics really sustained me um, in a large part um, through that time. And um, so, again, two graphic novels later, I, you know, I was, I was drawing Commandy when I got the call to make graphic novels and I could not have cared less about Commandy. You know, the DC book that I would have probably killed a man to uh, work on a year prior, <laughs> suddenly I didn't care about it. And, um, you know, feelings change and times change and um, just your perspective changes. So, um, you know, now I, I kind of waited around to decide on what our third book was gonna be. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna give Marvel a call again. Um, and I ended up, now I'm, I'm just finished my third short for Marvel. Um, so um, just within comics, you know, I've never been able to focus. I'm always either inking my friend, Phil Hester, I don't know if I finished that part. We still work to this day um, together, but um, sometimes I write, or sometimes I draw the stories he writes. Um, it's great having a collaborator like that, but you know, I also write and draw my own graphic novels. The only thing I don't do is color, because I'm colorblind. Um, but, uh, and then now, you know, adding on top of that, uh, I just finished a Spider-Gwen short. Um, and so drawing comics in the Spider-Verse, and that's, it's just been really, gratifying to um, finally have that, you know, those opportunities and that success, um, you know, after all that um, not succeeding for so long. So I lied to y'all. I said I wasn't gonna ramble up here for a long time, and I did, and no one raised their hand, so I just kept going. Um, but uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions or specific things, yeah, we can just open it up to, you know, some Q&A. And I don't know how long we wanna go, um, you can cut me off when I need to start drawing, um, but just let me know. I am tired, but it, I'll be here all night. <laughs> um, yeah, you had a question? Um, did you ever discover or consider any other artistic mediums like along the way while doing this? No, no. not at all. <laughs> Very, I mean, like, it's pretty rare for someone, it's not, it's not incredibly rare to have you know, most of the time, especially when you work for Marvel and DC, you really specialize. Um, you know, you either just write, you just pencil, you just ink, you just color. So it's it's not unheard of. There are a lot of cartoonists who can do everything. Um, and I certainly have my strengths in penciling and inking. Um, but no, never once thought, I need to do a paint. No, I, or any kind of outside comics. I, I For the briefest of moments, I thought, maybe I could side hustle some political cartoons. And that was like a fleeting thought. I, just like, I remembered the experience, I was like, I'm not doing all that. So yeah, no, it's pretty focused. Um, yeah. Hey, so you said you're colorblind. So can you go, <laughs> it seems like that's something, in, I don't know, I don't, you're an artist and, and tell us about the colorblind. So it's color know? deficient in red and greens. So I still see color, but the intensity of red and green. Um, so if I'm looking, like if my kids are doing sidewalk chalk and they're doing in pink, I can't see that at all. It just doesn't appear to me. Um, I don't see bright reds, I don't see bright greens. Um, I have color corrective glasses that I can wear. My brother and I are the same and my parents got them for us uh, five years ago for our birthdays. And uh, so we put them on and went driving around and like, it's, and it's, it's, it's assaulting. Uh, we went into a Target, it's all red. <laughs> And we're just like, it's, it's so jarring because I'm so used to seeing something a certain way. And it's just because, you know, those receptors in my eyes don't work to see the end of the spectrum for that color, that, that really bright. Um, so when you all see like really lush green that's bright and popping, I can't see that. It just looks like kind of a, a more muted green to me. Um, and so there's just only a certain range that I can see. Um, I was still able to pass color theory and, and, and it helps to really understand it, um, to know like when I look at certain things, um, I, can, I can imagine it's probably just based on the colors that are around it. You know, everything else is bright and then there's this kind of really muted green that looks natural to me, but I'm like, everybody else has probably seen something pretty bright. So do all these get colored then, all of these things? Yeah, so I hired my friend Dervla Kelly. Um, she lives in Ireland and um, she colored sort of super and, and I have color notes that are wrong. I, and I know, I, I, 
I don't know, but I'm like, hey, I'm, I might be way off here, but um, what do we think of this? And then they'll, like my art director, you know, we're not doing this in a vacuum. There's a whole team editorially that is helping us. Um, so, you know, they're, they're really nice and they know about my color blindness and Dervila certainly knows. Um, and so they'll be like, There's, it's fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> and I trust them. So um, yeah, it's, it's not as big of a problem. Um, it just, I mean, it, I'm trying to think of any other funny anecdotes. The, the one I can really think of is the, my kids are just going to town on pink sidewalk chalk and nothing is happening. <laughs> what is going on? So, um, yeah. Yeah, that would be smart to have a, to have a model. I don't. Um, everything is this. I mean, I drew these characters for so long that they were really, um, really, really fleshed out by the time I started doing them in graphic novels. But you can tell, like, if you open up Sword of Super and look at page one, why it looks like a six-year-old kid, because that's what I had been drawing him as. But in uh, middle grade world, um, you know, you're, you want that age, the books that are targeted to that age group, they want to be a little bit older. So he was aged up to 11, um, but really didn't look like an 11 year, and probably still doesn't by the end of it, because it's super cartoony. But you can tell he gets bigger <laughs> as the book goes on, if you put them side by side. And then when it came time to draw the Magma Cup, it was like I re regressed. Um, he ended up being really small on the cover. And I, I thought I fixed it, and everybody seemed fine with it. But I look at that cover, I'm like, man, yeah, again, he looks, he looks like a six-year-old. Um, Nobody seemed to really bother any, it didn't seem to bother anybody, but uh, yeah, model, model sheet. I gotta, so I, I, I have done that for, uh, when I got asked to do a, a spider bite story in Edge of Spider-Verse, it was such an intricate costume. Um, I don't know if anybody saw Across the Spider-Verse, but uh, Margot Kess is the digital avatar, uh, Spider-Man um, that, uh, and so they want to do a comic book, and I, that costume, it isn't, doesn't look like it does in the movie, but it's still super intricate. Um, and I had to do a character turnaround just to get a feel for it, just to draw her twice. And, and you know, really, it really, really helped because um, I went in with an approach that I wouldn't have otherwise. So it's a smart idea. I should do it more often. Yeah. Okay. I know you mentioned before that you saw certain characters and were like, oh, I can draw this, and it actually was harder than it was. Uh, this is a question in two parts. Who's your favorite superhero, and how easy or hard is it to draw this character? So my favorite superheroes have always been, um, I'll, I'll have two parts to this answer. So what, what I meant really by, you know, like just, just looking in general about the, at the aesthetic of comic books, um, and how realistic those look versus something like Peanuts, which is deceptively simple. That's more or less what I was talking about um, in terms of like difficulty of drawing. Um, once your approach gets kind of to where it needs to be, like I have an approach for, you know, when I draw for Marvel and DC now that is separate from when I do my really cartoony stuff in graphic novels. Um, but it's still a valid question. Who's hard to draw? One, everything is hard to draw at first. Um, my favorite characters are Spider-Man and Superman, and uh, they both have their difficulties, but it has been fun over this last six months, especially when I have downtime between projects. Um, and it was funny because before I had drawn Spider-Man in that book, I wasn't scheduled to draw any of it. Um, they hadn't offered it to me yet, but I, I, in my head I was like, what if I get offered Spider-Man? Like, I don't have, a, I, don't, I don't know what my Spider-Man looks like. You know, you look at the entirety of, you know, the history of, you know, these characters that have been published, you know, probably only Batman has been published more than characters like Spider-Man and Superman. Um, and each person brings that really personal flair to it. I was like, I gotta figure this out. So I did start just doodling Spider-Man drawings um, and, and figuring out, you know, like, I mean, other jobs are really important and I'm over here like, hmm, how many webs is too many? Um, <laughs> like, how small should his eyes be? And how spidery, like, 
do I go Todd McFarlane um, and Eric Larson 90s style with, uh, you know, like hiking his legs over his head when he's web swinging? Um, or do I keep it a little bit more grounded like a John Romita? Um, so um, I don't have those answers yet, but I did get to draw him. Um, he's on he's on a page back there. So uh, I, th I, I did spend a really long time on just that one. It took all of my willpower. It's not Spider-Man's book. It's a book called Jackpot, which is Mary Jane's secret identity. Now I know comics are, God bless you comics. You are so weird. <laughs> Never change. Um, so it's Jackpot's book, but Spider-Man appeared on one page that I was asked to draw. And I'm like, it took all my willpower not to just like ignore all the storytelling notes in the script and like draw a half splash of Spider-Man swinging at you. Um, just, just to be able to do it, you know. I, I told the story properly, but I did kind of make that middle panel. Spider-Man was not supposed to be any kind of focal point in it. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta at least try. <laughs> so I thought it worked out. But um, Superman, um, that drawing there, uh, I don't know where it is. Um, that's not a published piece. That was me looking at Ed McGinnis. Um, it's my favorite Superman artist. Um, for me, like just kind of the happiest any kind of art can make me as far as superhero comics goes, it's Ed McGinnis' Superman um, that he did around 2000. Um, so I was just kind of answering that question, what does my Superman look like? And uh, I was kind of trying to take my own aesthetic, but still doing this really cartoony, like Ed draws everybody with like hyper, real, hyper, it's not realistic, they're balloon people, like the, the you know, the biceps and everything is just inflated, like, you know, if there's a, opening on the back, you just blow him up, and uh, that's what he looks like. Uh, so I was just kind of trying to take that, like what really worked for, I don't know how well that Superman looks. I was excited when I drew it, um, but that's kind of, I don't know if that answers your questions. I, again, I just start talking about, um, yeah. I'd like to say you draw something. I wonder if you could, how do you approach drawing a human figure from scratch and also like a human head? I'm not gonna do that, because that's really hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I would probably just say, like, a lot of drawing is a lot, I wrestled in high school, I, my analogy for drawing, like, when you say approach to drawing the human body, we're going to be here a while, because I'm, I'm just, I have a figure, um, like, you know, and I'll just kind of illustrate this a little bit, but, you know, when you start to draw a figure, it's all rough, and so, you know, if a guy is just standing there, you know, it's going to be, okay, and I'm not putting a lot of thought into this, so much more thought goes into what you want to be, let's just say he's standing there with his hands on his hips. You know, you're going to just sit and scribble basically until you have um, a figure. But I'm doing this all super fast and I'm not really paying any attention to his proportions. Right now he's like, what, 20 heads tall? So, you know, then you go back in, you kind of like, okay, I got to make his head bigger and maybe, eh, maybe I want his shoulders to be a little bit wider. He's got a little bit more. Um, he's going to be a superhero. So let's, you know, now we got to, and so you just, like, it just takes such a long time. Um, I'm happy to draw something for you, but I come prepared with fast things that I've done a, done a million times uh, that won't be, that won't take all night. And um, so I'll draw you Wyatt from, and so it's going to be a cartoony figure um, and just the head, but um, the approach is kind of the same in terms of you start rough, and you just um, refine as you go. In each step, there's more refining. So with Wyatt, you just start with a really big head and then that little crosshair, you know, find your landmarks of where his nose is gonna be and why it has really, really big, earnest eyes. Um, but from there, you know, I've drawn Wyatt a few hundred thousand times. Um, it's just a lot of muscle memory with this character um, that I've all but forgotten because I've only been drawing Marvel comics the last few months. Um, but luckily, this is starting to look like Wyatt. Um, you know, he's really cartoony, um, but I've kind of memorized his, where his, you know, the curve of his cheek is and how that connects into his ear how his hair falls over that and that big, you know, unrealistic mop on top of his head. Really reminiscent of Calvin. Thank you, Bill Watterson. Steal from the best. Um, 
And so this is just kind of how a drawing st uh, starts at any stage. Um, just really rough. And from there, if this was a graphic novel especially, um, I'd go in and then I'd really, you can kind of see three lines there. Now I go in and I really decide where that line of his mask is going to be and um, do that across the whole drawing. You just start to refine it. And, um, you know, if you look at the pages all around, you know, this is a lot more involved process when you're doing a page because there are so many more elements. But each step, each element kind of goes like this. And so you just keep finding those proper, proper, it's comics, <laughs> nothing, nothing about this is realistic, uh, but just looks right for the character and has the right feel for um, the story. So, um, and the more you draw, um, a character, the more familiar you feel with him or her, um, a lot of this you can do away with. Um, this is about as refined a drawing um, as a Wyatt drawing gets. If I'm doing Spider-Man, I'm actually going in again, another penciling step, and I'll take a mechanical pencil and I'll really figure out where those lines are. And I'll make a really tight pencil drawing. Um, but I've drawn Wyatt enough that I don't really need to do that before I start inking. Um, so with Wyatt, I'll just go right into inks at this really loose stage. And there are some benefits to that. Um, this has kind of pushed my aesthetic this way um, when I draw in a cartoony style. And um, you want a drawing, the tighter you get in your pencils, drawings can feel stiff. Um, and it kind of depends on what the pencils are. Um, sort of super drawings never really feel stiff to me. But um, even still, the inking, you, you just start drawing in ink. Um, and it figures I pick the one. Yeah. Um, okay, so when I talk about professional pencils, it really just me. I what I really I don't I don't remember the context I used it. Um, what I think I meant was um, if anybody remembers what I said. Oh, so when when I'm talking about that, I just meant a professional a professional's pencils. Phil's are a profession. Phil is a professional. So they're they're definitely. I mean. It's a wide range. There are people who work for Marvel and DC who have a style that is not what you typically see in, you know, like a standard, I say standard, but like, you know, there's kind of that, if you think about a line, you know, in the middle, man, a lot of those comic books kind of look alike. I mean, they kind of have a style. Sometimes you call it a house style and then you can get it on that fringe and that's where you get the really good stuff. Um, and, you know, there's a variety in the middle too, but um, in general, what I mean, what I meant was just those are professional quality pencils. And um, when you have a penciler who isn't inking themselves, um, there is a level of uh, unfinished quality that an inker needs to bring to it. Um, and to your second question, um, so how, how expensive can you get with pencils? I will not draw with anything but this. And this costs, back in the day, like a quarter, maybe 50 cents. Um, I love the way this pencil feels. They're discontinued. Um, I bought probably 20 of these in college and I burned through my, my stash probably about 2014. Um, found one pack on eBay for like 10 bucks. I was like, great, I'm set for a little while. Started drawing a lot more, burned through those and went a few years without finding any. There was like one in a pack for like 20 bucks. I was like, I gotta find something different. So what I did was I kept all the little nubbins and I just got an extender. So that really extended the life of like the 20 nubbins that I had. But once I was done with the nubbins, 
I was getting pretty close and someone online had six boxes. <laughs> so one drawer in my tabaret is like hundreds of these pencils. <laughs> and hopefully that will last me. Um, but it really, like, what you want, it, it's all about the feel for you and what you, like, how you work and what you want a pencil to do. Um, that's really all that matters. Um, and this really stuck out to me because uh, one of the few things Bill Watterson um, would talk about in the back of his Calvin and Hobbes books, um, he talked about inking, a, like, the, the perfect tool for something was inking it with a stick he found outside. Like, that's the only mark he could, you know, like, the only thing you could find to make the mark that was in his head. And I was like, yeah, it really doesn't matter. So it's really about trial and error and what works for you. So you don't have to have expensive things. Um, these are like 250. Uh, these are discontinued. Don't buy these. If you, if you do see these, call me. Um, I will outbid you. Um, you know, these, a, a couple bucks, they're just, brush pens and text pens like it's not a um, really expensive and paper too um, I drew the first two graphic novels on Strathmore like 500 like 40 bucks a sh uh, pad 45 50 now everything went up since COVID um, kind of ran out and needed an emergency pad of cheaper paper it's just like a Michaels and uh, love it won't go back <laughs> um, so that's what this is it's like a 300 um, yeah, 300 series smooth, and it just, I love the tooth of it. It's, it's barely there, um, but now if I go back to that more expensive paper, it feels waxy. Um, Marvel and DC will send you boards because there are specific lines, and so I asked them, like, DC boards are great to work on. I love DC paper. I asked Marvel, and uh, Marvel farms out to a company called Eon, which is really, really bright, and I don't want to take anything away because there are a lot of people who really, really like Eon boards, but for me, it was too bright, and it almost had, like, a really... The, it was too smooth of a feel, so I scanned Marvel's template into my computer and loaded up my own paper, and now I have Marvel boards on, you know, the paper I like to use. So it's really all about your own feel. Um, yeah. Um, when you, um, especially when you have a script you didn't write, you kind of um, go through and you want a focal point or what's the most exciting thing to draw on a page. Um, so like that. Um, I picked something really splashy back there as far as I, the spider bite stuff that you can't see would have been so much cooler to show you um, to illustrate this, but you just kind of take a focal point and you build around that. Um, you know, when you design a page, you want, or I, I at least really want to have a really dynamic composition so that literally with the things you see in a, in a, in a panel, you want, um, if this is your page, let's say, this is your panel. You want the eye to almost do this, like it take you through the panels and almost like a, I don't know, doesn't really work here, but uh, you know, you want a guy punching, you want his arm to take your eye through that panel. There, that's his hand. I know you can't tell because it's just little scribbles, but there's his shoulders, there's his torso, there's his face, he's happy. He's punching a bad guy. <laughs> um, so. So his, his arm is coming across and he's punching. And now with the guy he's punching, yeah, he's, his eyes are, woo, punch my eyes out. <laughs> um, but you take his body and now you have those two motions in the composition to guide your eye back to this panel, even though you know, just kind of instinctively the way we read um, left to right, um, that that panel is going to go first, that panel is going to go, but you really want it to zip. You want it to really sing. Um, so if you look at the compositions, hopefully I've done a good job in the samples up here. Um, the first page of Sword of Super is a really good example. Um, but you, you're going to want your compositions to guide your eye through the panels where you need to go next. And it's not, I, and that's just a general, we don't have rules in comics, it's all traditions and what works and what doesn't. Sometimes that doesn't work, but most of the time, that's what we strive for. Um, so um, even though this is a punchy panel, let's say like there's a splashy panel at the bottom. So uh, after he punches the guy, he's just talking. So that, that's boring and I'm just gonna draw, you know, this guy, he's smiling because he's happy he punched him. 
Um, and maybe his arm is giving us a thumbs up to guide us to this panel. And so I'll make this panel small too. And then, you know, that's when I'll draw something hopefully really cool like, you know, Spider-Man swing. It was Spider-Man. Spider-Man was happy. <laughs> um, so then you see, you know, he's upside down. He's still happy. You can, he's not wearing his mask. Everybody knows who he is now. Um, but maybe this foot is breaking that panel right there to lead you down into this happy spider swing. And maybe I'm drawing a really big, and you know, this is all going to get cropped off. But that's the arc of the web leading you to the next page. Um, so that's kind of a real quick breakdown of kind of the stuff you want to strive for when it comes to, um, yeah. Uh, what pens do you use to ink? What pens? I use a. I'm not going to be able to pronounce it properly. Um, Tombow Fudenosuke, um, a Tombow number two. Um, yeah, it has the, the, the tip is flexible but stiff, and it can get a nice variety of line weights. And I, I can continue inking this instead of talking. Um, um, not for everything. So um, when I do sort of super, because it's a really like, you see, these lines are not slick and they're not. Um, what we kind of call sexy lines. Um, they're, they're fun and they're vibrant and they're inexact. Um, you know, these um, pencil lines are just kind of guidelines um, because I'm just going to come in and you see the motion of my hand. I'm not stopping. Um, I'm going for an energy, not an exactness. Um, but when I do Marvel comics, it's the exact opposite. And um, you're going to get pens like uh, I've got a Stedler number one here. Um, I didn't really bring it. I use a variety of those. Um, but on those, like, so when it gets down to his nose, um, you know, this is kind of how every line looks like in, uh, like, the Marvel comics I draw. Everything gets really exact if I use this. And it gets to more of that... Um, I don't know how to describe that aesthetic, but it's just a little bit more, um, not sturdy, um, <laughs> boring, no. Um, it doesn't have the liveliness. Um, it still has some liveliness. You know, you can still get really, um, you know, once you get going and you're, you're not, gonna, this is such a small pen. I don't even know if you can see the lines coming out. They're really small. Um, but, you know, you can still get a little bit of variation. It's just not much, and um, it's just kind of what those the aesthetic of those kind of called or call for. Whereas Wyatt here, I want to, I want a verve, I want um, you know some rhythm and excitement. I want a little bombast in, in a lot of those pages because um, I want the lines of this book, uh, you know, my inking to reflect the kind of boundless energy he has uh, just throughout those books. So that uh, you know, your aesthetic can inform um, and should inform. Um, you know, it's every step of this, from inking to coloring, penciling, writing, it's all storytelling. It's all in service to the story. So um, that's my sermon for, for, for today. Yeah. I guess I have a couple. Um, do you, is there a, do you, do you do conventions? Do you yeah, conventions? yeah. So, Sounds crazy, but yeah, I, I get out and. <laughs> yeah, so but we do have a. Um, there's really only two or three guys who do comics professionally in Iowa. You know, you, I'm a third of the whole group, but there's a Midwest scene um, Minnesota, Nebraska, not really Nebraska, uh, Minnesota. <laughs> Kansas City's big. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of good, talented people in Kansas City. And so we see a lot of those people. Um, and Iowa does have really, um, they've, they've had a pretty robust convention scene in recent years. Um, so it's been, it's pretty fun to see. The other question was, what, um, what does your comic collection look like? Uh, it's about 20 long boxes in my basement um, that are all unorganized except for Spider-Man. Um, it's just stacks everywhere. And um, man, someday I'm going to get to it. Um, but I... I was I just told this story. I don't I don't I still buy new comics. Um, I don't do much old collecting um, because the longer you kind of read comics, they're a really cyclical thing, 
And um, even though I still love new stories and I still want to keep um, kind of uh, abreast of what others are doing, um, the stuff I really, really love, um, you know, that those questions have been answered, and it's all you know, big like the runs of Superman from the early 2000s, uh, the Spider-Man comics, um, you know. And sometimes it can surprise you because you can go back and um, I recently started reading a series called Spider Girl. It was this what if story of uh, they did this story of Spider-Man where him and Mary Jane had a baby um, right when I started reading comics, and then they just they got cold feet and they were like, this Peter Parker can't be a dad, you know. Uh, we gotta get rid of this baby, so they wrote it out. And, uh, but they did a what if story of like, what if she you know, grew up to have spider powers? And then it was so popular, they did over 150 issues. And I didn't read this when it came out, uh, but now coming back as a dad, like dad Peter Parker is my jam. <laughs> I love these stories. I love seeing the kids succeed. Um, and her name is Mayday and she's, you know, the, she's kind of the best of Peter Parker and Mary Jane. Um, so you kind of revisit those stories that I really loved as a kid in a new light. And, and that happens from time to time, um, but my, my collecting has been more artists that I love, um, original art from Superman comics, and I have Spider-Girl pages. Um, so like when you get into the really old stuff that I would really love to own, like Steve Ditko, um, you know, those early Spider-Mans, and you know, for even a ratty copy, you're gonna spend $400. Um, that siren song of original art, like, but you could own me. <laughs> if you're gonna spend that kind of money. And so I just, that's just where my tastes have gone. So I don't do a ton of old comic collecting. Um, yeah. For someone who shares your passion for comics, uh, but completely lacks the mechanical skill, uh, skill to make them themselves, what advice would you have, or what avenues would you suggest if they want to see their own stories told with regard to just, the just do it. There's, it's, it's the coolest thing. There's. <laughs> I know that sounds like a, such a cop-out of an answer, but if you want to see your stories, um, technology is such that you, know, you have the internet now, you, have, you can have a website, you can have social media, and I'm not saying it's going to be a rousing success in terms of audience, um, but you can get that story out there and you can find your people um, who want to read that story. Um, as far as like, the technical aspect of it, like, that just comes with doing. Um, and I think another component of doing is, is just reading a ton. Um, this is such an art form that it's, it's, there are technical books out there that you can read. I would encourage you to read, like Will Eisner wrote a ton of books, um, comics and sequential art, graphic storytelling. Like he was just a master of the form and he was really inventive. Um, so you, you can do those things, but you learn a ton by just, you know, I've learned so much by just reading every single issue of Spider-Man that has come out since I was in the third grade um, and devouring just um, all sorts of storytelling. Um, and you, yeah, you just learn so much and you, but really you learn by doing. Um, and, and so I know it just sounds like a really simple thing, well, just do it. And you know, you don't think about how you feel when you're in a drawing, you're like, this is terrible and I'm never doing this again. Like, um, if you have that love for it, it will, still st it will sustain you through it. Um, and if you don't have that love for it and you find that out, I, <laughs> I have had multiple people come up to me in recent uh, months, um, like, hey, you probably don't remember me. Uh, I was a student back in 2012 and uh, we, talk I, we met and we talked about the business of comics and um, I wanted to be a comic book artist and I decided not to. Like, man, I'm really bad at this. And this is like three <laughs> times it's happened. Like, I don't have a single success story of like, hey man, I'm still doing it, I'm still here. Um, but really, um, I like to tell, I got tons of stories. So I like to tell a story about the first professional I ever met, it was a man named Ron Wagner. He drew a ton of Marvel Comics, um, Ghost Rider, Morbius, it was really big in the 90s, um, when I was really devouring a lot of um, the, the, the first comics I was. Um, reading and so when I was at Iowa State University, he um, moved back to Iowa. I found out he was from a small town called LeGrand, had moved out to New York, had worked for Marvel for many years, um, moved back to Iowa. They got him to come talk to us and uh, the first thing out of his mouth in this lecture is, the first thing I can tell you about getting into comics is don't get into comics. And it was just like, sailed right over my head, like, yeah, but how do you get into comics? <laughs> and uh, um, you kind of need that. Um, you need that, like, 
know, ignorance, stupidity, whatever you want to call it. Like, I, if somebody is going to tell you, don't get into comics and you listen, I've, I truly believe it was never going to happen, no matter how hard, well, and forget I said that part. If you listen to it, like, that's your answer. Um, so if you don't listen to it, you know, that's still unanswered. It's still this hopeful thing. And so I don't ever tell people, and, and I'm still pals with Ron, and we chuckle about it. And, uh, but he, I mean, he's right, too. Like, don't get into comics. This, like, you really, really just have to love it. So um, anyway, I forgot your question. I'm just rambling now. <laughs> um, I hope it was answered. A, a little bit. A little, OK. If there's, what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, I mean, you, okay, I, I have a concrete answer other than just throwing it out in the wind. Um, go to comic conventions. Artist Alley is full of people. Artists love to help other artists. Um, if you find one that doesn't, wow, I, I, I never have. Um, so everyone loves to give their time. Some are harsher than others. Ron, you know, just don't do it. No. But most are really, really helpful. Um, and want to see you succeed. Because while Ron opened his, you know, that was his salvo, opening salvo, um, you know, he went in and talked about it and talked about why he thought that way. And it was really smart because, again, if you're going to get talked out of it, um, you were never going to do it anyway. But he also sat down with me um, later, looked at my stuff, looked it over, told me what needed to be worked on. Um, and you know the comics I was making isn't something he was into, uh, but he might have had somebody else to you know kind of point me in the direction of, or um, but that's just one guy. When you go to a comic book convention, Artist Alley is hundreds of artists, um, so that's an option. And just finding people your age who are into comics um, can be a big help, um, and kind of cultivate that together. Um, you know, that sense of community, even if you're not making the same kind of comics, you still have someone in the trenches to kind of move forward with. Um, so there are a lot of options out there, but I, there's no surefire way to, like, there's no roadmap. You gotta find it. Um, I, can, I can only give you so much of what my experience was, but nobody has had my experience but me. Everybody's is a little bit different. There's gonna be a lot of overlap. Um, so I hope that isn't discouraging, but uh, I think that's the best kind of way I can answer that question. What? Last one? Last one? Yeah. Lettering. You do the lettering too. How, how hard was it to get that exactly the way you wanted it? That's a great question. I love ending on this one. So, lettering. The only job I've ever been fired at. <laughs> um, so when I talk about, you know, growing up and just doing it all myself. Lettering was a part of that because, you know, at the time, technology had not advanced to where digital lettering was a thing. Um, so I was just constantly doing it myself. And when I, I, so when I did meet with Ron the first time, his biggest critique was, your lettering, are you using, have you heard of an Ames lettering guy? And I'm like, Ron, I am using one. And it was just so bad. So it, you know, it gave me something to work on and it was just something that, um, for my own comics, you know, everything you do has a voice. And when it came time to do Sword of Super, I had been lettering those comic strips my whole life, and I thought I'd gotten pretty good at it. And the lettering definitely reflected, again, that energy and that best. It had a voice that matched um, what we were doing. So I was about a chapter in. Um, I should finish the part where I got fired first. Um, <laughs> we were doing a book called Shipwreck, which was not my art. Um, but they thought it had this really unsure, um, uncertain vibe to it. And we were reflecting that in the inking and the storytelling. And they're like, this would look really cool hand lettered on the board. And I'm like, yeah, it would. Oh my God, it would take me hours to letter a page. And you're getting paid like 25, maybe 15 bucks to do it. Because digital lettering, a letterer can fly in on a book and you know finish that in a couple days. Um, and here I am tacking on hours of just one page. Um, so I was struggling, and at about four pages in, I just get a call from the, uh, from Phil, who was penciling. He's like, "Hey, Warren Ellis was writing." He's like, Warren says, "Stop." 
I'm like, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was really happy to get fired from that job. So fast forward to sort of super again. Um, I really wanted it to be my lettering. And I got about a chapter in, and my editor's like, hey, we're doing, this, uh, we're doing the lettering digitally, right? And I'm like, no, I'm doing it on the page. And she's like, yeah, OK. So she kind of disappears for a little while. A couple weeks later, she's like, yeah, we can't. Um, these books are published in many different languages, so we need those word balloons to be empty so we can translate. Um, so we made a um, compromise. They would uh, make a digital font out of my lettering. And so that's what you see in the book. All the originals of book one are lettered because I had the time and I liked doing it. Um, and everybody told me I was crazy and wasting my time, but those pages look awesome. And someday when I decide to sell them, I'm sure people will appreciate that the lettering is on them. But uh, right now, I just, I, it made me happy and I did it for me. So um, I don't want to know how many hours that took, but it was a lot, but it was cool. And it didn't take me near as long to like letter that as it did those shipwreck pages. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, thanks again. I, I, had a, I hope you had a good time. Like I said, I love talking. Now you, now you know that I love talking. <laughs> we wow. so appreciate you coming up to be with us. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you.